Hi, I'm Elijah Notable, and I'm being joined again by Matt Kaponik, one of our engineers. Hey, Elijah, it's great to be with you. Um, yeah, I'm Matt Kaponik. I am uh, an engineer on the back end team. I work on the Notable app and also uh, the ChatGPT plugin. Uh, really excited to talk about uh, the new feature that we just got out, re-enabled username and password, sign up and login when you install the Notable plugin in ChatGPT. I think that's going to be uh, well received by a lot of people who preferred to use the username and password or initially use the username and password over in our app instead of um, in the ChatGPT plugin. I also am going to talk a little bit today with you about uh, OAuth in general, uh, some lessons learned in building the plugin that might help other plugin developers. I am active on the OpenAI discourse and also the OpenAI Discord. I am Kafonic over there. I'm happy to help other plugin developers in the plugin discussion section of their Discord. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions uh, after this video. As you said, today I wanted to talk um, a bit about the back end uh, security and architecture that you don't normally demo because it's not that jazzy, but it is important for users. And so um, the, the hot new feature that I want to show is that uh, when you install Notable now, and it redirects you over to Auth0 to log in with your choice of account. The, the email, the site username and password uh, sign up is back. Uh, we've done some major backend updates to our database and to our uh, backend API so that we can handle enforcing email verification now. Um, and that lets you uh, install the plugin, which is, um, which is great. Uh, when you do sign up for username and password, you will have to go look in your email for a verification link before you can start interacting with uh, notebooks and such through ChatGPT. But uh, it's really exciting to get that, that account option back. Uh, when you're interacting with notebooks or projects or anything like that from the ChatGPT app, when, when you did that initial install and chose which account to uh, authenticate with, uh, that gave ChatGPT back a token that it can use to communicate with the Notable API. That token, yeah, I've got some uh, got some graphs that can help uh, illustrate this. So yeah, when ChatGPT installs, it, um, it it gets a token back from the OAuth provider, and for Notable, that's Auth0. It uses that token to communicate with the uh, the Notable API on behalf of you. When you are logged into the uh, for the Notable app UI, the front end of Notable is doing the same thing. It's uh, it's getting a authorization token from Auth0, and it makes authenticated API calls back to our back end. You know, if you want to do programmatic access or uh, the way that we've implemented our scheduled notebook runs, it also like you have the option on uh, giving yourself a uh, an API token. You can generate a new API token here and use that to uh, interact with our backend API. So the, the way that we authenticate is, is with these JWTs. It's a common paradigm for software. The JWT is a JSON web token, um, and it represents uh, a great place to, to learn more about this is that uh, you go to JWTIO. These JSON web tokens are, they're strings you, that you put in HTTP headers, and they contain some information about um, your identity. Uh, when when Auth0 creates one of these JWTs, which has something like your sub, uh, your principal um, ID, uh, it signs that payload. We look up the signing key from Auth0 for, uh, for the, the tenant that you got directed to, um, and we can validate that uh, the JWT was signed by the Auth0 tenant that you went and uh, logged into. And that's sort of how the the uh, identity and authentication um, happens. Uh, I want to talk about why we use uh, OAuth and, and why an individual identity is really important. We implement RBAC, which is role-based access control. It means that when you create a project or when you create a notebook in a project, by default, all of these are only available to you. Uh, when I first create this project, nobody else can access this project except me until I explicitly uh, share that access um, either by making it visible to uh, other logged in users or by adding specific people and setting their role as contributor or owner or, or something like that. When you make a notebook in ChatGPT, it is by default only available to you when you're logged in to the UI. Uh, your data is 
uh, safe and secure until you make the conscious decision to share it. And all of that identity management, you know, the chat GPT making a notebook on behalf of you, or really as you, as it's the same kind of token that the front end UI uses to interact with the back end, that's the underpinning for that uh, security framework that we've implemented here at Notable. So if I were to log out of ChatGPT. When I log into ChatGPT, and I have a couple different login options, I personally use Google OAuth. I've logged into ChatGPT with, with my Google account. ChatGPT performed an OAuth operation over to Google and said, I have a browser connection to my backend server. I'm going to redirect them to Google, and they can choose to uh, log into their Google account, and that'll send a token back to ChatGPT, ChatGPT can use that token to see some information about me, like my email address. Now, I can't use that token to actually log into Gmail. I can't use that token to access my emails or anything like that. These tokens have uh, different permissions and scopes associated with them. In this case, ChatGPT only knows that I am uh, I am Kafanik at Gmail. When you work with a plugin and you install the plugin, that will perform a, an OAuth operation separate from your ChatGPT login. So I could be logged into ChatGPT with my Google OAuth, and then I could install the Notable plugin uh, and interact with Notable with a totally different email account. They're uh, sort of separate account management um, concepts. So Matt, it seems like these diagrams really explain to folks who want to develop their own plugin, how they can work through this process to ensure that they have the right setup for, for auth. I can't wait for more people to make ChatGPT plugins uh, for all the different services that are out there. And OAuth can be a little complicated. So I, I wanted to share some of the internal documentation and diagrams that we've created here at Notable uh, out with the world. I've worked on OAuth for the backend part of the Notable application. I guess I've been involved in some of that work for about a year now. And when we built the ChatGPT app, uh, I was um, one of the people who, who created the OAuth portion of that app. Um, and I've handled a lot of database and backend changes that have supported some of the decisions we've made, the improvements we've made recently for account linking um, by email address so that your GitHub uh, OAuth and Google OAuth login give you the same notable user account, as well as uh, enabling the, the user pass feature or the user pass option uh, back on the, the ChatGPT plugin that we talked about earlier. And I wanted to share some of our internal documentation and, and my experiences with OAuth out to the broader community in case anyone else is thinking about writing a ChatGPT plugin that would use OAuth. Now, ChatGPT plugins can have generally three different auth mechanisms that you choose from. There's a, a no authentication where ChatGPT just makes calls to your API with, with no identification, uh, no, no ID token at all. There's an option where ChatGPT will send a sort of an identification token that says, this is ChatGPT making the, the network request out to your API. And then there's, uh, and then there's finally OAuth. The, the former two use cases, uh, the times where you wouldn't need authentication, you could imagine if somebody's writing a ChatGPT plugin that just returns the content of Wikipedia articles. You don't need to log in as a user in order to get those wiki results back. However, if you are uh, if your backend service, um, you know, needs to identify a user, like in Notable, we need to know who is making a project or who is making a notebook for those, uh, those RBAC um, implications that we talked about, uh, that then you need to implement a lot. And so uh, a quick five minute overview of, of how this all works is that when, when somebody installs a plugin in ChatGPT, they do a little redirect dance over to an OAuth provider. Notable uses Auth0, so you've seen in some of our videos that uh, when you install the Notable plugin in ChatGPT, you get sent to a, uh, a URL that starts with something like auth.notable.io. Uh, once you've logged into OAuth and uh, to the OAuth provider, and, and that itself could be yet another OAuth flow. For instance, when you get redirected to Auth0 and you choose to sign in with Google or GitHub, it will redirect you again to Google or GitHub. There's kind of a, you know, it's it's OAuth all the way down. But eventually, once you've logged in, uh, Auth0 will send a token back to ChatGPT, and that token is uh, representative of your identity. 
doesn't necessarily have a lot of information about your identity. It might just be a user ID that Auth0 knows about, but um, the backend API can use that uh, to validate that you are who you think you are by uh, checking the, the payload that's in that token and validating that it's signed by Auth0. So this is kind of your, your generic OAuth flow. If I have some you know, React, Next.js based front end, when a user comes to, uh, you know, to my URL, I do the auth0 OAuth dance, I get back a JWT, and I include that as an authorization bearer header when I'm talking to the backend. If the backend doesn't see that header or that header is not validly signed by auth0, it'll turn back a uh, 401 unauthorized error sort of the generic approach uh, to Auth0. Now, when we get to uh, how, the, how the ChatGPT plugin, um, the plugin is effectively the same as a front end. When you install the plugin, you get redirected to Auth0, ChatGPT stores that token. ChatGPT uses that token in all of the requests to the plugin. And so if your plugin is like ours, where it's sort of a middleman between ChatGPT and our, and our real, our main backend API, uh, then we will just pass that JWT on through. The ChatGPT makes an HTTP request to the notable plugin. The notable plugin reuses that JWT and HTTP request to the API, and that's how your identity gets passed over. So when you ask ChatGPT to make a notebook for me, ChatGPT uh, sends a, a request to our notable plugin, create notebook operation with that JWT in its header, and then our plugin sends an HTTP request over to our backend API. Uh, the appropriate endpoints to create notebooks, uh, including that JWT. And our backend API takes that JWT, checks that it's valid, uh, and then it knows who you are. When you're developing uh, a ChatGPT plugin um, and you're trying to you know, configure your application in Auth0 or something like that, there's a couple of really key um, I guess of values or keys that are sometimes unclear uh, in the docs. So for, for ChatGPT to uh, redirect you to Auth0, and then once it gets redirected, once Auth0 redirects you back to ChatGPT, and then ChatGPT needs to make this post in order to get the, uh, the JWT. There's, there's a couple of keys that need to, um, to match up in your OAuth provider config and, or your Auth0 config. When you click develop your own plugin, um, ChatGPT will give you the option to, to put in client ID and client secret. This needs to match uh, the client ID and client secret that is in your, um, your OAuth provider. And this one's going to be really obvious to find in there. Uh, now, a couple of the, the harder ones to recognize is that in your manifest file, um, you're going to need, it's going to ask you in the manifest file to fill out client URL, scope, and authorization URL. Uh, the client URL that you want to put in there, this is the first redirect to Auth0. It's uh, typically the authorization endpoint, I believe. Uh, I think I have that information maybe in a different diagram. The authorization URL, this is going to be the sort of the, the post back. So, um, so when you're looking at your OAuth provider, the the the, end, the URL, the endpoint that your OAuth provider wants you to do the first redirect to, that's the client URL. Once it's logged in and redirected you back, the URL that you should post to with the one-time code that, uh, that you got on this, this 302 right here, that, sh that needs to be the authorization URL. And you're, typically your authorization URL is going to include the client ID and client secret that, uh, that you uh, also entered when you clicked develop your own plugin. It's going to have that one-time use code, and then it's going to have a redirect URI. Uh, the redirect URIs um, within your OAuth provider, you're going to have to fill out a uh, kind of a white list of redirect URIs, and obviously you want ChatGPT's um, you know, host to be on that because it's got to redirect the user back there. What do you see as a uh, common places? You were talking about that, that people needed to be aware of which URL was which. What are the common areas where people get confused in this flow? I think the wording around client URL and authorization URL is easy to, to misunderstand. Um, and when you're looking through the doc, there's, there's both a lot of documentation and also not enough great documentation on OAuth flow. 
And I think it's been a little confusing because there's been OAuth 1, there's been OAuth 2, there's been sort of iterations and designs. But I think, I think in general, the, the documentation uh, out there for OAuth is, is not the clearest. Now for plugin developers who uh, have a system set up like us, where we have uh, you know, our main UI app, and then we have the ChatGPT plugin, uh, a, a good best practice to follow here is to have uh, what are called different applications in Auth0. Uh, these are really just different, different sets of configurations within your OAuth provider. Um, and so I want uh, you know, people who are, or uh, users who are coming in through our, uh, our UI app um, to get issued a JWT, uh, this bit of configuration and ChatGPT to be issuing JW or getting JWTs from this other one. The JWTs themselves will be uh, equally valid and um, the payloads in them are could be the same, um, but we can uh, sort of manage some different configurations such as the list of redirect URIs, uh, which is like the, you know, the front end UI is host versus ChatGPT's host. And we can also configure things like allowed logins. So we might um, we might allow user and password sign up in our front end UI, but not allow that through ChatGPT. Uh, the reason that we, um, for a, a long while, was we're not allowing user name and password sign up through ChatGPT is because we were enforcing email verification in Auth0 so that a user had to verify their email before Auth0 would give the JWT back to the, uh, the client, in this case, ChatGPT. And now the same thing would happen with our front end UI, but since we controlled the code on the front end, when Auth0 gave us back a 401 and an error detail saying that the user has not verified their email yet, and therefore we're not giving you a, a JWT to use, we could write the code in the front end to say, ah, we got an error message. You need to go e verify your email before you can start uh, interacting with us. Since we didn't control ChatGPT, uh, or we couldn't control what shows up in ChatGPT, what would happen is the ChatGPT would get back an error message, would not show it to the user. You would see it in your browser console if you looked, um, but the plugin uh, install would fail and there was just no, no really good way of, of getting out of that uh, until you verified your email, which you wouldn't know about because ChatGPT wouldn't tell you to go verify your email. Now we've uh, recently restructured our, uh, our database and our backend so that we handle uh, checking the email verification uh, over here on the API. And so um, we've updated this application. So it now allows username and password. Uh, and I'm, that was a, uh, a, a good bit of backend work. Uh, and I wanted to say all that because I'm, I'm proud that we've turned this back on and it's such a small little user feature, but it, it took some, uh, some kind of deep work to get done. So when you're saying you were handling it now with the backend API, that's opposed to handling it via HTML? It's a good question, Elijah. When I say that we're handling it on the notable backend now, what I mean is that we've turned off the rule that we created in Auth0 to not give JWTs back until the user has verified their email. Instead, what happens is uh, you sign up with username and password, uh, and it gives back a JWT. Um, and in the identity section of that JWT, it says that the email has not been verified, but it's still a valid JWT. It's still signed uh -huh. by Auth0. And so when the front end UI or ChatGPT um, sends a request to create the user on the back end API, mm -hmm. uh, and it sends over that valid JWT on the back end, we do a, uh, a get to the identity section, identity endpoint on Auth0 in order to get back that user's, uh, to check whether that user is verified or not. And if they're not verified, then we make the decision on the back end to return a 401. Um, what happens when we create a user that's not verified? Well, we've split our database out to have a user's table and a principal's table, where the principal's table represents the login mechanism, such as Google or the username and password sign up. And the user's table is can have multiple principals, so you could, uh, as my kafonic at Gmail user, um, I could have a principal for my Google OAuth login or my username and password sign up using that same email. So when we create a username and password account and we check that it's not ver it, it's not verified, then uh, in the principals table, the, I've added a is verified column. 
And uh, for the username and password, initially that's false. And so if you were to uh, try and make a request to the API, we would do the database lookup. This would, at this point, say, oh, this, this username and password principle is still false, return a 401. So the user is there, um, but you would get a 401 if you tried to interact with any API. So every time a user makes this request, um, if, the, if the principle has not been verified yet, we do a, a check to Auth0 to see have they verified yet. And if so, we update the database and then you're able to interact with uh, the API after that. And so in ChatGPT then, if I haven't verified my email, now you have this way to surface in ChatGPT, hey, you have to go verify your email first before we can keep going. That's exactly right. Yeah, I'm really excited about this feature. So the way it works is that you will be able to, uh, when you install a notable plugin and it redirects you over to Auth0, you can now sign up with a new account with the username and password that will go create the user account who's not verified yet, but it will successfully install the plugin. At that point, you would then say, start interacting with the, the language model, say, create me a new notebook, plot a sine wave, do whatever. And as ChatGPT makes that request to our plugin, and our plugin makes, you know, passes on the JWT to the back end, the appropriate endpoints in the back end API, and it does the database lookup and says, ah, this, this username and password principle, it's not verified yet. It'll return a 401 back to the plugin with a, a body uh, of that 401 saying error, unverified email, and this, this is the email that's not verified. And the plugin will translate that into a message to ChatGPT saying, uh, this user is not verified. They should uh, check their email for a verification link. Everything will work after they click that. If they don't see a verification link, we have a nice little landing page where they can uh, resend the verified or reach out to support it notable for some help. I feel like you're saving a lot of future plugin developers a lot of headache. I hope so. Um, I mean, you guys, uh, there was some expensive engineering time uh, that took to for us to understand OAuth, and I hope we can save some time for other developers. Um, I am active on both the OpenAI uh, discourse and also the OpenAI Discord. Uh, I'm Kafonic over in the Discord. Uh, plugin developers, um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer questions there. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, hope this has helped everybody. I'm sure it has. And uh, I think that it's an interesting topic for folks to better understand. You know, part of our mission is to enable everybody to work with data the way they want. And part of that is, uh, you know, raising your general level of data literacy, coding literacy, and even for the systems literacy. But I think that uh, it's the plugin developers that really understand these, these diagrams that are going to benefit tremendously from this. So thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Thanks, Elijah. It was great talking with you as always.